the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening and welcome to tonight's About Women Lecture. My name is Melissa Golub and I am the Assistant Director of Tourism Talks for the Center for Adult Life and Learning. This evening I am privileged to present two outstanding English scholars who have distinguished themselves in the field of women's literature. They are Susan Gubar and Sandra Gilbert. They met at Indiana University, where both were engaged as English professors. A friendship developed, and they soon discovered they had a mutual interest in 19th century literature, which culminated in a course they taught together called The Mad Woman in the Attic. This led to a collaboration on their first book of the same name to be followed by several others. The Mad Woman in the Attic, the woman writer and 19th century literary imagination was a runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction and nominated for a National Book Circles Award in 1980. Sandra Gilbert is currently a professor of English at the University of California. She has an undergraduate degree from Cornell University and a doctorate from Columbia University. Susan Gubar is a professor of English at Indiana University. She earned her bachelor's degree from the City College of New York and her doctorate from the University of Iowa. Both Gilbert and Gubar have received many awards, including Ms. Magazine's 1986 Woman of the Year Award, which they shared. They have been collaborating since 1974 and to date have co-authored The Mad Woman in the Attic, No Man's Land, Volume 1 and 2, and co-edited Women's Poets, Shakespeare's Sisters, and the Norton Anthology of Literature for Women. Next in their plans is to finish the final volume of No Man's Land and to revise the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Susan Gubar and Sandra Gilbert. I, I suffer from technology anxiety. Is this working all right? Uh, the last time I looked, I was Sandra, and she was Susan, I think that's, but we still are. Um, I should say that what the talk will offer you tonight is a um, very drastically condensed version of the last chapter of Volume 3 of No Man's Land, which is entitled Letters from the Front. And I should add that this was written entirely collaboratively, which means that we were always in the same room at the same time with two pencils and two notebooks. And that means that neither of us is personally responsible for a word she is saying. <laughs> in particular, if I say anything you don't like, you blame her. Um, the title of the talk is The Further Adventures of Snow White, Feminism, Modernism, and the Family Plot. Something happened to sex on the way to fatal attraction, Thelma and Louise, Madonna, Robert Bly's best-selling Iron John, and Susan Faludi's equally popular Backlash. The outlines of the old fairy tales about relations between men and women blurred and mutated in increasingly complicated ways, so much so that many of us, feminist critics, cultural historians, seem to be lost in a forest of stories about the future of sexuality and sex roles. Has any sense of an ending to the gender revolution emerged in recent decades? Take that age-old favorite, Snow White. In the 70s, when we were writing The Mad Woman in the Attic, our first study of the female literary tradition, we dramatized the dilemma of 19th century women, especially women writers, through a discussion of this tale. There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl, died, and was replaced by a wicked queen who became stepmother to Snow White, the nursery classic tells us. When a maternal figure becomes self-assertive, we suggested in our analysis of the story, it is as if a good mother had died and been replaced by a wicked stepmother, so that the tale illuminates the contradiction between socially prescribed char characteristics of femininity, the silence, immobility, and beauty of the daughter heroine on display in a glass coffin, and the rebellious woman artist's desire for power and freedom 
the crafty second queen's plots to destroy the appropriately feminine Snow White, as well as her ferocious dance of death in fiery shoes. But as we now conclude No Man's Land, the place of the woman writer in the 20th century, the three-part sequel to our earlier volume, we feel we've been reviewing so many new and different plots, all of them explored in various ways by 20th century women writers, that it's no longer possible to propose a monolithic tale about the female imagination. What had been a single tradition has, after all, become many traditions as women's sphere widened and the certainties of men's world crumbled. How, after all, would a modern storyteller narrate the dilemmas of Snow White, the Queen, the King, the Prince, and the Dwarves? To begin with, she might, like Walt Disney, invoke the Ur tale. There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl child, died, and was replaced by a bad queen who became the stepmother to a daughter named Snow White. Who is the fairest of them all, this bad queen asked her mirror. She loved herself and hated Snow White. But soon the mirror told her that Snow White was fairer than she, so she set out to kill the girl. She hired a huntsman to take Snow White into a large dark forest and tear out her heart. But the huntsman pitied the sweet child, let her go, and brought back to the queen instead the heart of a wild boar, which she ate in triumph, thinking it was her stepdaughter's heart. Still, the mirror told her Snow White was the fairest of them all. The beautiful daughter had escaped. Yes, she had gone to live with seven dwarves in a cozy cottage just on the edge of the forest. There she cooked, cleaned, and whistled while she worked. <laughs> But the queen, hating the beautiful beloved girl, could not rest and sought to plot the child's doom. Murderous that she was, she disguised herself cleverly in order to offer three poisonous gifts. First, as a traveling peddler, she sold Snow White a suffocating corset. Then, as a gypsy beauty expert, she gave her a deadly comb. Finally, as a kindly farm woman, she proffered an evil apple. One bite, and Snow White fell into a deathly trance. The unhappy dwarves lovingly placed her in a splendid glass coffin so that everyone could see how exquisite she was. And sure enough, a prince soon came along, fell in love, and took her back to his palace to ornament his throne room. But miraculously, as soon as she was brought to the royal palace, Snow White threw up the bad apple, lived again, and became a queen herself. And when her wicked stepmother was bidden to the lovely girl's wedding with the prince, that bad woman danced herself to death in fiery red shoes. Now Snow White and the prince could plan to live happily ever after. But would this version of Snow White seem nostalgic, anachronistic, kitschy? Might not our contemporary Scheherazade, like Donald Barthelme in his postmodernist novel Snow White, feel impelled to offer variations on, indeed radical revisions, of the old theme? If so, surely her variations would reflect the sweeping cultural metamorphoses that attended late 19th and early 20th century women's entrance into the public sphere. First, she would have to take into account the sex wars that were generated by the suffrage movement in particular and the woman question in general. Second, she would have to dramatize the sex changes associated with such battles as well as with transformations of the family romance and altered definitions of the erotic. Finally, she would have to confront a heightened and increasingly widespread consciousness of the artifice of gender itself, its status as a social construct. Indeed, storyteller though she is, she might even have to meditate on current ideas about the artifice of identity. Despite her best efforts to achieve narrative closure, moreover, she would probably find herself entangled in multiple endings, confused and bemused by a cultural pluralism that makes definitive denouements virtually inconceivable. Let's imagine the first story that she might tell. If she were to proceed to address gender issues historically, it would probably be a tale of sex antagonism, a tale that asks whether Snow White and the Prince, the Queen and the King, can make love, not war. 
Our first variation on Snow White confronts this question, answering it in some of the ways established by authors from Alfred Lord Tennyson in The Princess, to Ryder Haggard in She, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman in Herland, and to filmmakers like the creators of Pritzi's Honor, Fatal Attraction, Sleeping with the Enemy, and Thelma and Louise all works that explore battles between the sexes, with the earlier group in particular focusing on the struggle for women's rights, and the second group meditating on what Susan Faludi has defined as a media backlash against the struggle for such rights. There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl child, died, and was replaced by another queen who became the stepmother to a daughter named Snow White. Who is the most powerful of them all? This queen asked her husband, the king. She loved herself and hated his smug sense of superiority. But the king quickly told her that he was 10 times more powerful than she and her stepdaughter Snow White put together. So she and the lovely girl plotted to kill the king. They lured him into a large dark forest planning to tear out his heart. But a passing huntsman rescued the majestic man and brought him to a male sanctuary <laughs> where seven dwarves and a prince who was in training for a job at court disguised him as a statue of God in a glass coffin. Still, through her magic arts, the enraged queen knew her tyrannical husband was alive and set out with Snow White to find him. The two women carried a banner demanding their rights to power and were armed with sticks and stones. But when they arrived at the retreat of the dwarves, their enemies bound them with tight laces, assaulted them with combs, and tried to cram poison apples in their throats. And although the brave Amazons unbound their stays, loosened their locks, and tightened their lips against force feeding, in the ensuing melee, the rocks these women flung smashed the glass coffin and woke the king who rose again more terrible than he ever was. But how would our modern storyteller end this tale? At least three of the following outcomes are implicit in many turn-of-the-century and even contemporary fantasies about sex wars. Choose your own adventure. One, the king rose again, more terrible than he ever was. Striking fear into the dark hearts of the rebellious women, the lawful monarch took the queen and Snow White prisoner and brought them back to his palace, where he locked them in a mirror-lined room. Now at last the foolish pair understood the error of their ways. Snow White spent her time trying on stays, combing her hair, preparing for her marriage to the prince, and asking the mirrors if she really was the fairest of them all. The queen happily cooked and cleaned for the king, whistling while she worked. <laughs> or two, the king rose again more terrible than he ever was, yet the queen and Snow White continued battling until they killed the king, captured the prince, and set the dwarves to cooking and cleaning even forcing them to whistle while they worked. <laughs> Triumphant, the two women transformed the sanctuary of the dwarves into a temple staffed by a host of priestesses. All of them joined in together in worshiping the divine spirit of the good queen mother who had given birth to Snow White. Or three, the king rose again more terrible than he ever was. But the queen and Snow White were equal to the occasion. Come, let us reason together, they exclaimed. <laughs> inviting the men to discuss their differences of opinion over a delicious apple pie. <laughs> Soon the king, the prince, and the dwarves saw the error of their ways. The woman's cause is man's, they agreed, wending their way out of the dark forest and returning to a commodious castle equipped with many labor-saving devices. <laughs> The king and queen, the prince and Snow White, entered into two egalitarian and sexually fulfilling marriages. As for the dwarves, they were integrated into a commune run by seven little women, where they raised babies and consciousness besides whistling while all worked together for a brave new world. While both the first and second waves of feminism clearly generated anxious plots about sexual warfare like those we have just summarized, other fin de siècle phenomena gave rise to a different set of scripts. The free love movement, so important to a writer like Kate Chopin, affected and reflected new definitions of female desire, in particular a move away from Victorian notions of women's passionlessness. 
At the same time, starting with the decadence in England, for instance, Aubrey Beardsley and Alistair Crowley, continuing through the writings of Lawrence, Miller, and Mailer, and still persisting today in, say, Playboy and Hustler, these reimaginings of a liberated female libido led to a sexualization and commodification of the female body in both elite erotica and popular pornography. No doubt in response to such reifications, some 20th century women writers, from Willa Cather and Edith Wharton to Erica Jong and Doris Lessing, either repudiated or critiqued the cultural construction of female heterosexuality. Our second variation on Snow White is meant to crystallize controversies about the erotic that have persisted from the turn of the century to the present. There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl child, died, and was replaced by another queen who became the wife of a sexually abusive king and the stepmother of a daughter named Snow White. Every night, the king assaulted the queen, and every day Snow White tried to comfort her and conceal her bruises. Who is the fairest of them all? This battered queen asked her mirror, and the mirror told her that her stepdaughter was the sexiest girl in the realm. This pleased the queen because she thought it might please the king. Either he would enjoy Snow White himself or he could sell her to a wealthy nearby prince. So the queen set out to perfect the child's charms. She hired a huntsman to convey the girl to a finishing school run by dwarves, where she would be taught costuming, hairdressing, and how to stay on a diet. It was her hope that her stepdaughter might become Miss Dark Forest of 1992. <laughs> maybe even a Playboy centerfold or a Hollywood starlet. But en route to the school, the handsome huntsman seduced Snow White in the middle of the forest. By the time she arrived at the Sybaritic mansion of the dwarves, she was quite adept in the arts of love. Indeed, she was ready to teach the dwarves a thing or two. I give myself when I please, where I please, she told them. And when the queen arrived on a visit, bringing in tow a charming and fabulously rich prince, it looked as though Snow White was going to live happily ever after. A range of endings to this tale can be extra extrapolated from such texts as The Awakening and Fear of Flying, My Antonia and Four Gated City, Tropic of Cancer, and The Story of O. Feel free to vote for your own ending. <laughs> It looked as though Snow White was going to live happily ever after with the prince. But alas, the prince found Snow White's jouissance rather unnerving. <laughs> he wanted her to marry him and settle down, while she swore that she would never belong to any man. Her plan of failure, the queen returned gloomily to the king, and beautiful Snow White disappeared into the dark forest, where she is said to be living a bold, free life to this very day. Or two. It looked as though Snow White was going to live ha happily ever after with the prince. But what a shock it was to Snow White when she discovered that the prince was hardly interested in sex at all and not very good at it. And yet she liked him just as much as he liked her. Besides, when she looked at the battered face of her stepmother, she doubted that a hard man is good to find. A good man is hard to find, she murmured, renouncing her desire for the exploitative huntsman and her pleasure in the dwarves' school for scandal. True, the king and queen were still <coughs> trapped in their old patterns, but Snow White and her new mild husband relished a relationship surpassing the erotic and settled down to run an apple strudel factory. <laughs> or three. It looked as though Snow White was going to live happily ever after with the prince. Sadly, though, the prince thought sex was dirty. In fact, he wanted Snow White to perform all kinds of unnatural acts. And when the queen saw this, she resolved to go along with it, since the king needed money that the millionaire prince was willing to pay. Before Snow White knew what had happened to her, she was chained and naked in a glass coffin, while the prince took his pleasure and some pictures of her. And the voyeuristic dwarves, along with the excited queen, watched and whistled as the couple worked. <laughs> when, quite unexpectedly, the king arrived on the scene, he too joined the happy audience. Although, as these endings suggest, the issue of heterosexual desire was a central concern for many, many modernists, a number of their contemporaries were influenced by the new discourse of sexology, which led them to analyze alternate modes of eroticism. 
During the same period in which, for example, Edward Carpenter and um, Havelock Ellis defined what they called the, quote, intermediate sex or the invert, such writers as Radcliffe Hall, H.D., Gertrude Stein, and Virginia Woolf explored lesbianism, bisexuality, transvestism, and transsexuality in a quest for sex role metamorphosis that obviously still grips the imagination of novelists and poets in the 1990s. How might these artists tell the story? There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl child, died, and was replaced by another queen who became the stepmother to a daughter named Snow White. Who is the fairest of them all, this new queen asked the mirror in her closet. And when the mirror told her that Snow White was the most beautiful, the queen knew that she loved the girl with a love surpassing the love of men. <laughs> But as the two grew increasingly close, the king became suspicious and plotted to kill Snow White. He hired a huntsman to take the girl into a large, dark forest and tear out her heart. The queen, though, got wind of his plans and arranged for Snow White to take refuge in a commune run by kindly dwarves. Here the girl studied her maternal heritage as well as the lives of the obscure and the little arts of talk, of dress, of cookery, and whistled while she worked. Sometimes, too, the queen costumed herself as a huntsman and visited her there. They spent many pleasant nights together. But the evil king was determined to put a stop to these unnatural activities, so he hired a mercenary prince to capture the girl. This clever fellow disguised himself as a medical man and offered her three gifts to heal her of what he convinced her was a neurosis. <laughs> a feminine costume, a new hairdo, and the fruit of his knowledge. When she tasted the latter, though, poor Snow White fell into a deathly trance and the wily prince immediately locked her up in a glass coffin so that he could transport her back to her father's kingdom. Before one could say abracadabra, however, the wise and loving queen appeared by the side of the coffin. Once again, if we translate the meditations of Radcliffe Hall, H.D., Stein, and Wolfe on alternative forms of the erotic into the terms of Snow White, we can propose a number of different solutions to the dilemmas presented by this plot. Pick your own favorite. One, the wise and loving queen appeared by the side of the coffin. Awake, my love, my fair one, cried the queen. Imagine her sorrow, though, when the entranced girl rose from her coffin, murmuring, I'm sorry, my dear, but my prince has come. As the queen and the dwarves sadly conceded that they were no more than a society of outsiders, the prince revealed that he had renounced his mercenary impulses because he had f fallen in love with his beautiful patient, and the victorious king emerged from his counting house to preside over the wedding feast of the young couple. Four, two, the wise and loving queen appeared by the side of the coffin. Awake, my love, my fair one, whispered the queen, hoping the prince and the king would not overhear her. Bewildered, Snow White rose from her glass coffin and whispered back, what shall I do? Marry the prince, but sleep with me too, muttered the queen. <laughs> turning and instructing the dwarves to begin baking apple tarts for the wedding feast. The prince confessed that he had always worshipped Snow White from afar and promised to impregnate her with a divine child. When last seen, Snow White, the queen, and the prince were making movies in the forest, while the beaming king followed them, carrying a jar of myrrh to celebrate the group's sacramental menage a quatre. Or three. The wise and loving queen appeared by the side of the coffin. Awake, my love, my fair one, cried the queen. And imagine her joy when the entranced girl threw up the prince's bad apple, rose from her coffin, and murmured, let us be queens together and collaborate on translating the works of my lost mother. <laughs> As an epithalamy enchanted by the sisterly dwarves rang out over forest hills, <clears throat> the spirit of Snow White's dead mother appeared on the horizon to bless the new couple and their newfound land. Everyone knew that this magical pair would find a way to reproduce themselves, perhaps mystical, perhaps technological, <laughs> and that they would bring forth a wonderful daughter of their own. As for the king and the prince, they soon reconciled themselves to this union that they had so long resisted. For when they met again back at the palace, they realized that it was each other they had always loved. <laughs> and at last their love dared to speak its name. 
Or four. The wise and loving queen appeared by the side of the coffin, but then inexplicably vanished. For a long time, Snow White lay in her glass coffin. To her, it may have seemed as if only a night had passed, but at least 10 years went by. Alas, both the queen and the king died in that decade. And when Snow White woke, she was alone in a forest of her own. The dwarves and the prince had disappeared. As she stepped out of the crystal cabinet in which she had been encased, a new day was dawning, and a fine wind was blowing the new direction of time. In the distance, she heard the roaring of a sexual conflagration she could not understand. Was that what had consumed the king and queen? Could she ever know? In any case, she need not marry, needn't pass the applesauce around the table. All around her, the leaves murmured, and words rose toward her from the woodland floor. Wonderful words but what was their meaning? If, taken together, all the stories we have thus far told reflect multiple modern responses to sexual warfare, heterosexuality, and homosexuality, our new Scheherazade's final version of Snow White is meant to represent the radical speculations of many contemporary critical and creative thinkers about the instability of normative categories of gender, race, and identity. Are such terms as masculinity and femininity, black and white, self and other, merely supreme fictions? These are issues which not only concern such major aesthetic innovators as Wolf and Joyce, but which still preoccupy theorists from Jacques Lacan and Jacques Derrida to Hélène Sixou, Lucy Rigaret, and in a different way, African-American critics from Henry Louis Gates Jr. to Barbara Christian. There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl child, died, and was replaced by another queen who became the stepmother to a daughter named Snow White. Who was the fairest of them all? This queen asked her mirror anxiously and incessantly, for she realized that she was no more than a mask, a costume, and so was her king. She loved Snow White, and she thought she loved the king, but who were any of them anyway? <laughs> Merely signifiers, signifying nothing. <laughs> or so she thought in her bleakest moments. Or were those moments her cleverest moments? <laughs> Everything seemed terribly indeterminate to the queen. <laughs> Do we even have a transcendental signifier? She had asked the king one dark night. I have no metaphysics of presence. I have nothing, he had replied sadly. <laughs> the unhappy couple wondered what to do and finally decided to send their brilliant daughter, Snow White, on a quest for an answer to the riddle of gender identity, a subject in which she had always already been interested. <laughs> Accompanied only by a philosophical huntsman, the girl made her way through circu circuitous paths into a bewildering forest of no names. Encountering a band of bookish dwarfs, she asked, am I her was you dreamed before? Incisively <laughs> quoting Joyce's Ulysses. But the dwarfs were silent. Their only speech was gaps, absences, lacunae. <laughs> Am I no more than a glass coffin, she wondered aloud, looking everywhere for a material condition. Suddenly a voice replied, a voice that seemed to come from the wilderness itself, but was really the voice of a prince from a neighboring kingdom. Not surprisingly, a storyteller confronted by this plot could only conclude the tale with, the, with a dizzy, dizzying array of indeterminacies, sex changes, race changes, role changes, which ultimately have the effect of undoing the basic premise of the grim tale itself. Again, though, decide for yourself on your own promised end. One, she heard the voice of the prince from a neighboring kingdom. Yes, boomed the prince. You are no more than a glass coffin, i.e. a language field. You are merely a construct, an epiphenomenon. As for the king and queen, they are supreme fictions of your imagination. Liberate yourself, kill them off. Snow White thought a minute, then she replied, ah, but none of us can be unless we become. None of us can exist unless we at least impersonate our gender assignments. The prince was bemused. You sound like an essentialist, he complained. <laughs> But then she did a radical thing. How about investigating the pleasure principle by disseminating your symbolic into my semiotic? <laughs> Funny girl asked. <laughs> and before you could say abracadabra, the prince came down out of the trees and fell to with a will. He and Snow White got married and spent many long happy hours in discussion groups with the dwarves. <laughs> Heart sick, the king and queen died without discovering any answers to their riddle. Long live the new king and queen. Or two. 
She heard the voice of the prince from a neighboring kingdom. You are no more than a mask, boomed the prince. Take off your face and look at yourself in that forest pool. And when Snow White obeyed him, she discovered he was right. She had never been white at all. She was coal black, and so she realized were her parents, the king and queen. What was all this jive about Snow White after all, she wondered. Someone had made her be not herself, but she did have a self. She was woman, and she was not white, and suddenly she was very angry. Angry at the tellers of this tale, angry at the authors of this talk, angry at the king, the queen, even the prince. Who was her real mother anyway, her birth mother? Dimly, she remembered a dark face, loving hands. Or three, she heard the voice of the prince from a neighboring kingdom. You were no more than a mask, a costume, a glass coffin, boomed the prince. Snow White was enthralled. What a relief, she exclaimed. Let's change places. There was a moment of silence. What, asked the prince, sounding nervous. Yes, insisted Snow White. Let's all change our clothes, our masks. Let the sexes intermix. She snapped her fingers, summoning the king, the queen, the huntsman, and the dwarfs in a prearranged signal. No more masks, she cried. Forget your transcendental signifiers and off with these landings. Suddenly the forest was filled with naked dancers of all colors and many genders. I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? They sang as they pirouetted among the trees. And the forest resounded with their joy, for now the king could at last become the queen, and the queen the king, and the prince Snow White, and the huntsman a dwarf, and the dwarfs kings, princes, queens, huntsmen, even a pack of cards. Checkmate, proclaimed Snow White, the war is over. Uh, (laughs) Our variations on the theme of Snow White are meant to be monetary and ironic, for they reflect just a few of the countless plots proposed not only by the writers whose works we have studied in No Man's Land, but also by a range of contemporary theorists, critics, and poets. To be sure, all continue to focus on the same question that the Oars story poses as we interpreted it in The Mad Woman. How is a woman to achieve personhood in the pleasure palaces of art and the artful palaces of pleasure? But because the very concepts of woman and man have been rendered increasingly fictive by a century of sex wars and sex changes, modernist and contemporary writers, female and male, have consistently investigated multiple engenderings of what once seemed to be a single plot. But that we have had to work with such radically unanswerable questions reflects, of course, the sexual ambiguity of the times in which we are living. On the one hand, some of the successes of women's personal and professional lives suggest that we've all come a long way out of the glass coffin and the fiery shoes. On the other hand, the culture we inhabit often seems like a misogynistic realm that wants to return women to reification in the coffin or to self-destruction in the shoes. So complex is the landscape of stories that those who dwell in it often cannot see the forest of the past and present for the trees of fiction. In 1972, as the second wave of feminism began to crest, Phyllis Chesler ended her influential Women and Madness with a series of 13 questions that do help to map this bewildering terrain. Earlier in her book, she had already meditated on the sex war that has concerned us too, wondering among other things, and I'm quoting, can women win the sex war or (coughs) banish such a war entirely without becoming the dominant sex? Is the sex war at the root of other major evils, such as race and class, slavery, capitalism, puritanism, imperialism, and warfare? And if so, can such evils be exiled from the mass human condition forever by any but a feminist method? What is a feminist method? But her concluding questions, besides continuing to explore the issue of sexual battle, (coughs) touched on many other problems associated with gender transformation, problems still hotly debated. For example, Chesler asked, would intense maternal and paternal mothering in childhood lead to wisdom and strength among women? Can new methods of childbearing and rearing banish the human tendency to arbitrarily interpret biological differences in oppressive ways? How can we dismiss all men, in quotes, as hopeless when some of the byproducts of power are knowledge, generosity, and likableness? Will lesbianism, bisexuality, and homosexuality occur more and more naturally among young people? What will this mean? 
How shall women learn to go beyond an incestuous and procreative model of sexuality? When can we stop assigning any significance to biological differences? From the turn of the century to the present, precisely these questions have engaged the attention of most literary women, as well as some of their male contemporaries. Indeed, whether consciously or not, in response to the persistent problem of gender identity, many writers created a complex cast of characters, some of whom inevitably play parts in our various versions of Snow White. The femme fatale, the new woman, the mother woman, the woman warrior, the feminized woman, the no woman, the female female impersonator, the goddess, the lesbian, the sextoid, the no man, the new man, the male male impersonator, the gay man, the transvestite, the transsexual, the androgyn, the he-man. It is as though an increasingly intense consciousness of the artifice of gender, fostered by radical sociocultural disruptions, has impelled many artists to wring every possible change on the ways in which the story of the relation between the sexes can be narrated. Of course, even these recurring roles in turn of the century and modernist texts should not be understood as monolithic. Olive Schreiner's new womanly Lindell in the story of an African farm is markedly different from Virginia Woolf's new womanly Lily Briscoe into the lighthouse. Marianne Moore's sardonic pose as a spinster schoolmarm is as different from Edna St. Vincent Millay's stance as a hedonistic flapper as it is from H.D.'s impersonation of a chaste Greek nymph. Radcliffe Hall's lesbian Stephen Gordon in The Well of Loneliness is not the same as the ironic speaker of the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, the invisible men and, quote, boys of the black literary tradition are not identical with Ernest Hemingway's impotent Jake Barnes or D.H. Lawrence's paralyzed Clifford Chatterley. And yet in some way, all these characters represent comparable efforts to solve problems posed by a world of sex wars and sex change. Letters from a literary front in which combatants and non-combatants alike report on the trenches of transformation. But although most of these characters have always been seen as crucial figures in modernist literature, few have until recently been defined as important, not in spite of, but because of the sex changes they symbolize. Yet most of them address or incarnate current feminist answers to questions like those of Phyllis Chastler. Thus, if we place contemporary feminist theory in the context of 20th century literature's obsession with gender and its discontents, we can see that feminists from Simone de Beauvoir and Kate Millett to Andrea Dworkin and Hélène Sixou have implicitly reconstructed a cast of characters which was of great significance to their aesthetic and intellectual precursors. More specifically, as they struggle to imagine the engendering of a new age, recent theorists aligned themselves in two camps. Gradualists, who believed in working within established social structures in order to achieve change, and radicals, who believed in obliterating most extant social institutions. Because of their dissimilar visions of the future of sex roles, these feminists tended to invoke different personae in the cast of characters we've just delineated. In one way or another, such representative gradualists as de Beauvoir, Betty Friedan, Carolyn Heilbrunn, Nancy Chodoro, and Carol Gilligan implicitly defined a redeemed future populated by new women, new men, mother women, and androgynes. For their part, such representative radicals as Kate Millett, Andrea Dworkin, Adrian Rich, Elaine Sixou, and Susan Griffin imagined a future characterized by escalating sex wars and therefore ruled by he-men and women warriors, or by the triumph of the female principle, and thus inhabited by goddesses and lesbians, or by a total annihilation of gender categories, therefore populated by polymorphously perverse bisexuals. At the same time, the figures we've defined as gradualists usually represent themselves as dispassionate commentators on history, whereas those we've called radicals generally become desirous impersonators of the future, even while they seek to anatomize the past. 
At least in part, moreover, such different discursive strategies arise from notably different attitudes toward the very issue of gender, and specifically toward the existence of a category called man or men. Perhaps for this reason, where the gradualists would opt for those versions of Snow White in which the prince and Snow White, the king and the queen, rearrange social structures so as to make common cause, the radicals would choose to promote variations on the story in which the prince and the king are either annihilated or relegated to a separate realm so as to liberate Snow White and the queen into a perfected herland. Despite the multiple inflections potential in the tale of Snow White, however, all the thinkers we have been discussing would have to agree that it is premised on one fact. Snow White is of woman born, and even in an age of in vitro fertilization and surrogate motherhood, she would still be of woman born. What are the literary historical consequences of the fact that this single constant endures? When we juxtapose the plurality of stories which reflect the, which reflect the massive social transformations attendant upon women's entrance into the public sphere with the stability of the biological fact of female maternity, we confront a new and interesting literary phenomenon, namely the emergence of what we're going to call the mother writer in the mid-20th century. It is as if in our own era, the good queen's entrance into sexuality need not necessi necessitate her transformation into the bad queen. In The Mad Woman, we argued that the real story of Snow White, as it functions paradigmatically for the 19th century female literary tradition, begins when the queen, having become a mother, metamorphoses also into a witch, that is, into a wicked stepmother. We would now claim, however, that for contemporary women, the tale has an entirely different premise. Given that women are no longer inexorably silenced and privatized by their culture, there need be no murderous conflict between Snow White and the Second Queen. And in addition, considering that there are new ways in which women can negotiate between procreativity and creativity, there, meet, there need be no split between Snow White's biological mother, the first queen, and her rebelliously artful stepmother, the second queen. For in fact, a number of women poets and novelists who came to prominence in the years following World War II were mothers, as were many other post-war women professionals. And these artists often focused on maternity as a subject of special interest. In fiction, for example, Doris Lessing, Margaret Drabble, Margaret Atwood, and Toni Morrison come to mind. In poetry, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, Maxine Cuman, Carolyn Kaiser, Lucille Clifton, and Sharon Olds. To be sure, from Anne Bradstreet to Harriet Beecher Stowe to H.D., from Elizabeth Barrett Browning to Rebecca West, women of letters have born children. But as Virginia Woolf noted in A Room of One's Own, and as Tilly Olson pointed out in Silences, literary ambition and the project of parenting have usually been historically incompatible for women. In particular, for modernist women, it seems that the archetypal figure of Mrs. Ramsey from Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, who always wanted to have a baby in her arms, had to be exorcised as definitively as Woolf's angel in the house in order to facilitate the creativity of, say, the new womanly literary uh, Lily Briscoe, or indeed of Woolf herself. Among the major female modernists we consider in no man's land, after all, most were childless, including Wharton, Cather, Stein, Barnes, Hall, Richardson, Mansfield, Wolfe, Sinclair, Moore, Millay, Sitwell, Larson, Hurston, McCullers, Bowen, O'Connor, and Bishop. Although each one's childlessness was, of course, determined by a complex of quite different personal factors, when taken together, these writers represent a collective decision to reject the materiality of maternity in order to achieve a transcendence, authority, and independence that most still felt had to be disengaged from the maternal feminine. In the versions of Snow White these writers might relate, Snow White and the second queen could perhaps make common cause, but the first queen still had to die after birthing her daughter because for the most part, maternity was still seen to be incompatible with worldly ambition. 
If then, as we argued in The Mad Woman, metaphors of creativity elaborated a symbolic equation of pen with penis well into the 19th century, even in the early 20th century, literal motherhood threatened to dramatize a contradiction between femininity and authorship. What Julia Kristeva even now calls the abjection of the mother and what Simone de Beauvoir some time ago saw as women's figurative imminence meant that even, or perhaps especially, those writers who felt themselves to be most exhilaratingly liberated from the traditional constraints of femininity had to reject what they considered the constrictions of maternity. Were such male writers as Yeats, Conrad, Joyce, Pant, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Stevens, Williams, Faulkner, Thomas Lowell, and Shapiro, all of whom, of course, had wives to do most of the work of child rearing, could easily opt for biological paternity without fearing that such a role would undermine their aesthetic authority, many successful modernist women could not take a biological risk that might reify them in just the sex roles they were striving to critique or repudiate. How then can we account for the achievements of the mother writers who mostly began to publish in the late 50s and who continue even now to play a crucial role in contemporary <coughs> literature by women? Has the first queen, or indeed Wolfe's Mrs. Ramsay, put on the body Judith Shakespeare laid down so long ago? Certainly, for contemporary women writers, the materiality of maternity no longer seems to undercut the supposed transcendence of fleshly imperatives necessary for or associated with literary authority. Evidently, in the last 40 years, women of letters have achieved a new kind of solution to the mind-body problem, not a monolithic solution by any means, and not at all one that we are particularly pres prescribing, but one that seems to be historically unprecedented. Paradoxically, those who solved the problem in the way we are describing here were products of just the feminine mystique that gave rise to the second wave of the feminist movement. Yet the paradox is more apparent than real. For if, on the one hand, this generation of writers grew up with a cultural ideology admonishing women to fulfill themselves by becoming perfect wives and mothers, they were also, on the other hand, citizens of a society that had been so radically transformed by the first wave of feminism that they were continually urged to realize their intellectual potential by going to college, getting high grades, and winning prizes and fellowships. For this generation, then, the notorious parable of the fig tree that Sylvia Plath's Esther Greenwood recounts in The Bell Jar was ironic rather than monitory, a joke rather than a, than a sermon. As you may recall, I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story, confides Esther, from the tip of every branch like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and so forth. But although Plath's heroine believes that choosing one fig meant losing all the rest, the poet novelist herself, along with many of her contemporaries, actually intended to live out Esther's desire for each and every one of them. Rebelling against the 50s strictures of Buddy Willard's mother, who insisted that, and I quote, a man is an arrow into the future, and a woman is the place the arrow shoots off from, Esther also rejects what she sees as the sterility of female professionals like J.C. and Philomena Guinea. And Plath herself, who planned to be an ambitious arrow into the future, nevertheless proclaimed her determination to, quote, go Virginia Woolf one better by writing great books and producing wonderful babies. Indeed, Plath's verse about her children inaugurated what is virtually a new genre in literature by women, a genre in which the maternal poetic voice addresses or meditates on the mysterious newness and otherness of a child whose ontological nakedness shadows our safety. Unlike such 19th century women poets as Maria Lowell and Lydia Sigourney, who tended to produce sentimental effusions about angelic toddlers and dead babies, writers in this new genre frequently provide keen analyses of both the physicality and the metaphysicality of maternity. For these writers, in fact, the crisis of delivery precipitates existential insights at least as grand as those yielded by the confrontations of male artists with the whiteness of the whale or the wilderness of deliverance. 
and many quite self-consciously bring to the surface the literary historical implications of such insights. Sharon Old's poem, The Language of the Brag, for instance, rivalrously boasts to Walt Whitman and Allen Ginsberg that in bringing forth a baby, she has done an all-American heroic thing. This is from Sharon Olds' poem. I have lain down and sweated and shaken and passed blood and feces and water and slowly alone in the center of a circle, I have passed the new person out. I have done what you wanted to do, Walt Whitman, Allen Ginsberg. I have done this thing, I and the other women, this exceptional act with the exceptional heroic body. More subtly, in a sardonic apostrophe to Milton, who made his illegitimate daughters read to him in five languages, the poet Bernadette Mayer reveals that she has nicknamed two out of three girl babies after great male literary precursors, Hawthorne and Melville. Caring for these infants absorbs much of her attention. Quote, the Melville one, though the smallest, wants the most. But Hawthorne will want to be nursed when she gets up. I can hear Hawthorne. I know she's awake now, but will she, will she stir, disturbing the placid sleep of Milton, of Melville? And yet these babies populate the scene of her writing. She says, they all see the light by which I write. Just as wittily, Anne Waldman turns to a single and childless female precursor, Emily Dickinson, to examine not, as Dickinson did, the problematics of female creativity, but the literary as well as the literal power of female procreativity. Waldman's poem begins, I'm wanton, no, I've stopped that. That old place, I've changed, I'm mother, it's more mysterious. How odd the past looks when I reread old notebooks. Perhaps Helene Sixou best formulates an assumption about the literary implications of maternity that at least in part underlies these poems when she asks, <coughs> in the significantly titled The Newly Born Woman, how could the woman who has experienced the not me within me not have a particular relationship to the written? From Anne Sexton's hymns to her little girl, her string bean, and Denise Levitoff's meditations on the mystic son who comes forth, to the nursing poems of Alicia Ostricka, Elizabeth Sokolow, and Anne Winters, the verse of women writers has undertaken two projects Sixou has called for. To define the child as the other, but the other without violence and to redefine maternity as a subjectivity that splits apart without regret. As Winters puts it in Elizabeth near and far, a subtly nuanced sonnet sequence to her daughter, no matter how closely bonded the physical mother is with her child, she must always be aware of the metaphysical distance between them. The poem, a few lines, there is space between me, I know, and you. I hang above you like a planet. You're a planet, too. One planet loves the other. <coughs> More subtly, in a sardonic apostrophe to Milton, who made his illegitimate daughters read to him in five languages, the poet Bernadette Mayer reveals that she has nicknamed two out of three girl babies after great male literary precursors, Hawthorne and Melville. Caring for these infants absorbs much of her attention. Quote, the Melville one, though the smallest, wants the most. But Hawthorne will want to be nursed when she gets up. I can hear Hawthorne. I know she's awake now, but will she, will she stir, disturbing the placid sleep of Milton, of Melville? And yet these babies populate the scene of her writing. She says, they all see the light by which I write. Just as wittily, Anne Waldman turns to a single and childless female precursor, Emily Dickinson, to examine not, as Dickinson did, the problematics of female creativity, but the literary as well as the literal power of female procreativity. Waldman's poem begins, I'm wanton, no, I've stopped that. That old place, I've changed, I'm mother, it's more mysterious. How odd the past looks when I reread old notebooks. Perhaps Helene Sixou best formulates an assumption about the literary implications of maternity that at least in part underlies these poems when she asks, <coughs> in the significantly titled The Newly Born Woman, 
How could the woman who has experienced the not me within me not have a particular relationship to the written? From Anne Sexton's hymns to her little girl, her string bean, and Denise Levitoff's meditations on the mystic sun who comes forth, to the nursing poems of Alicia Ostricka, Elizabeth Sokolow, and Anne Winters, the verse of women writers has undertaken two projects Siksu has called for. To define the child as the other, but the other without violence and to redefine maternity as a subjectivity that splits apart without regret. As Winters puts it in Elizabeth Near and Far, a subtly nuanced sonnet sequence to her daughter, no matter how closely bonded the physical mother is with her child, she must always be aware of the metaphysical distance between them. The poem, a few lines, there is space between me, I know, and you. I hang above you like a planet. You're a planet, too. One planet loves the other. <coughs> of course, a number of contemporary male poets, Donald Hall and Galway Canal, Philip Levine and Robert Pinsky come to mind, have written works to and about their children, with at least some of them participating in the two projects that Sikh Su has outlined. However, the genre in which they work is paradoxically far more traditional for the, for, for the father poet than for the mother artist. Such disparate figures as Ben Johnson, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and William Butler Yeats, after all, compose significant verses to and about their offspring. If, as Stephen Daedalus so famously contended in Ulysses, paternity is always a fiction, it has also, perhaps for this reason, always been fictionalized. But the factuality and literalness, literalness of maternity can be, as we have seen in the works of the new mother writers, even more dramatically metaphorized. Both in body and in mind, the mother experiences the ultimate Emersonian relationship between the me and the not me, and thus the most powerful antidote to that phallocratic structure of domination and colonization which Sikhsu calls the empire of the self-same. Simultaneously historian and prophet, the literal and literary mother has to realize that she has given birth to potentiality, to multiple possible plots. At the breast, writes the poet Celia Gilbert, there is the pounding of the heart bearing story after story. With Lucille Clifton, the mother knows that her own history, my almost me, is mirrored in the lives and bodies of her children, even while a different destiny, my more than me, awaits them. Addressing her offspring, therefore, the mother writer looks backwards and forwards, <clears throat> always conscious that the child is both a question that the past asks the future and a question that the future asks the past. How, then, would this newly born mother writer tell the old story of Snow White? Would she tell it at all? Or would the disintegration of the family romance implicit in the self-possession and autonomy of the mother annihilate the very concept of the story altogether? Would the configurations of king, queen, prince, and Snow White be so radically altered as to defamiliarize and defamiliarize these characters altogether? Or would the newly born queen pretend that the old stories are still viable and recycle the past in a series of parodic mimes and masquerades? Would Snow White, in an effort to differentiate herself from her powerfully integrated mother, be driven to imagine matricidal plots as lethal as the old infanticidal ones? Would the king and the prince so envy the queen's combination of physical and metaphysical authority that they would depart from the story altogether or determine to reinstate the premises of the primordial tale? There was a good queen who pricked her finger with a needle, watched blood fall on snow, gave birth to a girl, girl child named Snow White, and lived to raise her. And sometimes when this queen looked into the mirror of her mind, she passed in her thoughts through the looking glass into a forest of stories so new that only she and her daughter could tell them. Thank you. Thank you.
that if we have a question and answer period, we can see you because it's impossible. Uh, yes, to it's see. possible. Uh, there are people there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a relief. We can hear you, but we couldn't see you. We're bound to have said something questionable. I don't think so. We always do. <laughs> That this is coming from. Uh, this is the third volume of um, this three-volume series called "No Man's Land: The Place of the Woman Writer in the 20th Century," and the title of that volume will be "Letters from the Front." But it's not yet out. But it's <laughs> would that it were. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, my mother gave me that to read right before the talk. <laughs> We're shocked, shocked. <laughs> it's a, it's. A, I mean, I think that it's oh, it certainly always has been a scary story. One reason that we used it in the way in which we did in uh, in the Mad Woman was because it was so incredibly scary. I remember being very scared by by the Disney version. I mean. What what heroin is there? I mean, what sort of Disney heroin is there? Quite so wicked as the as the wicked stepmother. She's like a paradigm of crafty wickedness or wicked craftiness. very complicated what's happening because yeah. feminist criticism has indeed tried to uh, be linked to politics even as established itself as an academically rigorous area studies program. So there's always been that kind of tension between politics and work outside in the women's movement and then the certification process of articles, writing, scholarship, etc. So that there's always been a kind of dialectic between those two. It seems to me, and I, I, I don't think we've actually really have a, a single answer to that, but I think there are two things going on that I see, and one is an academicizing of feminist scholarship in women's studies uh, as it becomes institutionalized, which in some ways threatens to drain it of a kind of political uh, impetus. And... Um, and that, that's something that's, uh, that I see as disturbing. At the same time, I think that there is a very interesting move in women's studies and gender studies now towards ethnic issues of difference among women that still has a very important political component. Yeah, I would, I would want to so. add, too, though, that um, we, we mentioned Susan Faludi's book several times here. I think that there's been um, a, a, a surprising amount of backlash even on campuses. Uh, of course, we see that kind of backlash from outside the academy in the incessant sort of reign of attacks on PCness, which always includes attacks on women's studies and on, on feminist, feminist enterprises in general. But, but even in the campus community itself, I would say starting in the middle 50s, both Susan and I uh, and, and many, many of our colleagues 
continually encountered among students uh, uh, several refrains. Uh, one was when, you, when we would go around a table in a small section asking people why they were taking a particular class in women's studies with us. Um, the kids would, kids who used to say, I'm a feminist and I'm really excited you know, about this, would start saying, um, I'm not a feminist, but... And we would ask them what they thought feminism was, and it turned out that they, you know, were all everything that feminism stands for, they stood for, but they wanted to dissociate themselves even from the word. Following that, and, but would be, but I believe women should have equal pay for equal work. They should have control over reproduction. They should be able to yeah. have marriages, right. families, and careers. But I'm not a feminist. Right? <laughs> and you say, well, what do you mean by feminist exactly? <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't clear. And the other thing that they would say when we would teach, for example, some of, let's say, 18th century texts in, in the uh, Norton Anthology of Literature by Women, just to give that book a little plug here, uh, they would say things like, well, that wouldn't be true anymore, that, she, that the woman would be suffering the way, you know, uh, Margaret Cavendish does or something. I mean, we've come a long way, Professor. And then when I would say to them, you know, well, I'm not ever sure, honey, how, long, how far we've come, you know, they would say, well, maybe for your generation things were tough, but not for us. And the usual answer is, come, come back, I'll be waiting for you in my office in 10 years. Come back and tell me about it. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, there's, that's a, a genre of, um, you know, male-identified women who, who uh, and I, we could name names. <laughs> We're not going to. We're not going to, but some people in the Quite room popular. probably there know some, some of the names that we would Academy. name. Um, but, and, and, you know, they're very problematic indeed. And those are women who want to uh, reject the feminist movement precisely because it has perhaps brought more women into the academy and into positions of power in the academy than, than there had been before, and they had enjoyed a kind of diamond-studded isolation. Uh, I mean, it's, an, it's depressing. The question is, how, how did you learn? Sisterhood isn't always powerful. It, it's just I mean, to yeah, finish. I, I think my response to what you're saying is absolutely that is always and always will be, and unfortunately has been for a long time, a problem, but that I think that you, you, it's easier to think about that if you do think historically. Um, I'm always reminded that um, when I went to City College, I never had one woman professor. Uh, and when I went to Michigan and Iowa for my graduate work, I never had one woman professor. I don't think a student at IU could get a four-year education without having quite a few women professors. Now, they're not all going to be feminists, but would we want to make it uh, necessary for them to certify themselves? And, I mean, you know, that's a problem. That's a real big problem. So I guess I would just sort of historicize the issue. The issue still exists, but other possibilities are still there. I think that's an astonishingly, there. that's a very important point. Neither did I ever in uh, four years at Cornell, several years at NYU, and four years at Columbia ever have a woman professor. I don't know what we, what those of us who were of, of, of our generation thought would happen to us when we got our PhDs. Were, we, were they going to issue us tweed jackets, pipes, <laughs> heavy, you know, manly shoes, beards? I mean... 
I think that, that I mean, I think that what's going, what, what is, what's going to happen is what has happened, as Susan says, uh, would be impossible at IU, would be impossible at UC Davis for students. It would be very difficult for them to go through four years. I'm looking at a colleague in the audience. It would be very <laughs> difficult for our students to go through four years at Davis and, and never have a, a, a woman professor. And that, uh, I mean, that change, it's, it's, so the change is one that maybe will be by accretion, that, I mean, yes, we know these... Yeah, I mean, there, there was sort of, yeah. yes, new models replacing old ones, and a lot more slowly than perhaps we would have wanted. Well, it's very hard to talk about something that we see as new emerging in a generation really after the 50s, after World War II, that's in the process of changing family plots and literary plots. So use, if you think about a plot as both a, a literary thing and also a social script for a life, I think one of the things we're suggesting is that the very old tension between maternity and creativity or ambition, that that tension is being negotiated in new ways, in many different new ways. But I think that I would say, too, that in a larger, more metaphorical sense, um, there's a feeling that uh, for a, a woman to figuratively or literally write to the future, to the child, to offspring, to descendants, is is for a woman to identify herself with an ongoing tradition that has entered history. In other words, the... She the, becomes a maker of the historical. Right. I mean, to the extent that fatherhood, that the metaphor of literary paternity, which preoccupied us a great deal when we were working on The Mad Woman, is a metaphor in which the man is a, is a begetter and founder of a literary line. Um, that that's sort of essential. I mean, that's that's the making of literary. He imagines himself as making literary history, literally making literary history and creating his own offspring. And so I think that for I guess for both of us, really, the, this the sort of metaphor almost of the mother writer is a very it's a very new one. And it seems as though there there had to come a time when there was no longer this dreadfully. A terrifying contradiction between maternity and creativity, uh, so that it would then become possible for maternity to be sort of metaphorically, symbolically resonant, and for it to signify some kind of entry into history and into a viable, ongoing future, where yes, our descendants, our our you know, the next generation won't be plagued with the same awful problems They'll that have tortured with us. Terrible and, uh, new problems. Us, us, <laughs> <we'll be their> <laughs> Very hard. It's very hard. I think that I think that we, we there's been a in connection with a, a number of scandalous events of this last year. There's been a real regrouping and revitalizing of of the women's movement, and so I, I hope there will continue to be. I mean, I think that both of us feel that our any comments we make are essentially we make them as participants and observers, but not as you know experts. But, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm struck on the one hand by the by the um, um, many uh, the power of many of the points that uh, Susan Faludi makes. I think they're very important. At the same time, I'm struck by um, by, a, by a real regrouping in response to um, the Thomas Hill hearings and you know countless other events. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry.
Ah, uh, Camille Paglia. Oh. Hi there, Camille. We were Hiya. waiting for you to show up. Hi, yes. When we do, surely the focus should be multiple. Surely the focus should be everywhere. I mean, it should be like, don't you? you I think our, our yeah. own focus tends to be yes. towards the past and present rather than predicting the future. And what our stance is is that literature is a way for artists to engage in these ideological debates. So that, for instance, when Faludi talks about uh, a backlash, a male backlash, which many women have entered into. And this, this, this sort of theme running through these questions that's very interesting about women who are participating in ways of oppressing feminism or degrading it. Um, what, we're, what we're talking about in our books is the ways in which throughout the 19th and 20th century, historically, male and female writers have used literature as a way of um, contesting the primacy of gender and the relationship between the sexes, of entering into these discussions. I know that doesn't answer your question, but I guess I'm, I'm not sure we can answer questions about Geraldine Ferraro or even Camille Paglia, except it's so much as to say that I think <laughs> literary historians um, who are studying even, let's say, Melville and... Um, and Waldman sonnet sequence are, in some sense, dealing with the same issues as, as, as you are. I would, I'd like to make one comment, though, about that, you know, about if, if it was, it, and I take it as very well, may have been Paglia who said, there are no great women artists, I know she thinks that. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary how in the history of, um, of women's struggle for equality and, and liberation and um, you know, an opportunity. It's extraordinary how often the same thing has to happen again and again and again and again. I mean, the Faludi book, in, in, in the Faludi book, Faludi makes the point about the backlash being a, a redaction of an earlier backlash. The kinds of struggles that uh, the second wave of feminists uh, had to engage in were in many ways replications of everything that had happened earlier in the first, in the first wave of feminism in this country. Uh, the argument about are there any great women artists, are there great women writers, can there be, can, could women even possibly write down a note of music on a piece of paper? I mean, those arguments seem to happen again and again and again. And that's something that I, it, it's worth paying attention to. I, it's, a, it's a dreary theme. But, um, but I mean, it's something that we might want to think about, why it has to happen again How and again and again. How can it be, if you really think about it seriously, that in, in the 1992, a literary critic, supposedly, is saying that women cannot produce great works of art because they are earthbound squatters. Yeah. And that men produce great works of art because of the arc of, of transcendence <laughs> that they produce. I mean, this is so off the wall, and I, I mean, it's so off the wall. <laughs> you just don't know how to deal with it. I think our way of dealing with it is, is historicizing it and saying, yeah. my goodness, the yeah. same thing that was going on, you know, when uh, Dr. Johnson said that a woman preaching is like a dog dancing. Hmm. You know, you're impressed they can do it at all. Hmm. Uh, that same kind of thing is still going on. Yeah. Well, now, let's, not, you know, let's, not, let's not end on a total downer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I want to say an upbeat note. Women are that. not earthbound squatters. Right. <laughs> second, point. second point, the second point is that, in fact, 100 years ago, we wouldn't have been standing 
in this room, having this conversation in this way, we would not have the, the, the opportunities that we have to speak in public. We, everything would be completely different. So, in fact, even though there is this nauseating sense of everything being recycled over and over and over again, the recycling is a, is a recycling with, with changes. I mean, there are, there are variations on the theme, so that's my upbeat. I, I, I end on an upbeat note in honor of my mother, who doesn't like me to be morbid. <laughs> She's right there. So. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.